Oh, thank you, Maxime. It's a, it's a great pleasure and thank you for organising such a, a great event. Um, okay, so I would like to talk to you today about something that I've been working on for the last 15 years or so called instant space analysis. Um, and it's really um, machine learning about combinatorial optimization. I know that this workshop is focused on machine learning for combinatorial optimization. And of course, there's this uh, wonderful recent paper, survey paper that, that talks about what that means. Um, my interpretation of what machine learning for combinatorial optimization means is very much around machine learning in support of finding solutions to combinatorial optimization problems. So, so from this paper, I've ripped out a few of the, the beautiful pictures here uh, to explain some of the typical approaches um, that you're all very familiar with. So, you know, the first approach they talk about is where you have a, a problem and you're trying to find a solution to this combinatorial optimization problem. And the role of machine learning is to serve as, um, in this example, uh, a cheap approximation um, to actually find the solutions, learning to find the solutions. And at first, I used to think that this was not really ever going to be possible, um, but I did actually get involved in a project where it actually gave quite good solutions. So, so I'm, I'm fully on board with, with that approach of using machine learning to replace um, the optimization search and, and learn to predict um, uh, good solutions. The second approach um, that machine learning for combinatorial optimization uh, often finds is where machine learning is serving as an input into the optimization problem. Um, so you've got your problem, you've got your OR techniques, your optimization techniques aiming to find a solution, and machine learning is supporting that some decision making into that process, whether that's uh, parameter configuration or pre-processing decisions about whether or not um, decomposition would be useful or linearization would be useful. And so the survey paper talks about some nice examples of where machine learning can, can help that uh, provide an input to an optimization process. And then the third one that it talks about is where that's more of an iterative process throughout the, the running of the optimization algorithm where you're repeatedly, depending on the state, the current state, you're repeatedly using machine learning, the same machine learning model to repeatedly make um, predictions uh, to help support decision making for the op optimization algorithm. Again, with the goal of finding a solution, uh, whether that's deciding the branching variables or like in a hyper heuristic sense, which operators should be using at each point in time. So, so that's um, machine learning for combinatorial optimization, where it's serving the role of helping the optimization algorithm deliver a solution. But what I want to talk about today is where machine learning can do more than that. Machine learning can do more than just helping find a solution or a combinatorial optimization. Machine learning can help us learn about combinatorial optimization. So, in other words, we can get the solution um, via sort of automated algorithm selection, some algorithm finds the solution, but the machine learning offers us much more possibility to learn more than just how to find a solution. It offers the opportunity for gaining insights into the strengths and weaknesses of a collection of algorithms, a portfolio, and also learning about whether or not we can even trust the solutions. So there's a whole lot more that, that we can do with machine learning when we marry it with combinatorial optimization. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today with instance space analysis. So what I'm really trying to do over the last 15 years, I've been a little bit obsessed with trying to essentially attach a warning label to algorithms um, that says this algorithm should only be used for the scenarios most similar to those described in the terms and conditions which establish its guaranteed reliability. That's, that's what I'd like to have. Um, I'd like us to know when each algorithm is fit for purpose, under what conditions can we expect an algorithm to perform well. And we're talking today about combinatorial optimization, but but I've been interested over the last 15 years in many different types of algorithms from different fields as well. But combinatorial optimization is my original field, and so that's where I started. So establishing those terms and conditions is really a mathematical challenge, the way I see it. Um, the choice of test examples is really critical if we're going to be having trustworthy algorithms. And, and I use the term stress testing. How do we stress test an algorithm um, to make sure that we can trust the conclusions? Uh, and the choice of test examples um, is really important because you could just easily choose a whole lot of test examples that an algorithm performs very nicely on and you believe that this algorithm is fantastic, please publish my paper. Uh, you might have to search a little harder to start to find some examples where it starts to fail, but they will be there. Um, how motivated are we to try to find those? Um, those of you who are 
editors of journals will will know well um, that sometimes we need to push back and ask authors to, to search a little harder to reveal the weaknesses of their algorithm uh, because they exist. Sometimes another algorithm uh, might quickly reveal its weakness. Um, and so it's up to us to decide, you know, we can shine a very positive light on an algorithm if we want to, um, or we can really try to understand the strengths and weaknesses in a, in a more honest way. Um, so trustworthy test examples have to have certain properties. Um, they should be unbiased. They should be demonstrably diverse. Uh, they should be challenging. We don't want a whole bunch of easy to solve instances that doesn't teach us anything. Um, they should be discriminating of the different performances between different types of algorithms, different families of algorithms. Uh, and ideally, we should know whether or not they're real world like. Um, and if we don't know all this stuff about our test examples, our conclusions are going to be inconclusive um, at, at best and, uh, and at worst, could be quite dangerous if we're actually deploying this algorithm. So the motivation then for instance space analysis 15 years ago, 15 years ago, I went to um, International Metaheuristics Conference in Montreal and gave some, a talk about some very early ideas. Um, and so I'm really pleased today to be able to give a bit of an update of how far we've got. Um, the motivation back then um, was, well, like many of you, I was editing a journal and getting a little frustrated with the quality of submissions. Um, this whole culture of here's my new algorithm. I tested it on these 10 or 15 chosen problems that I cherry picked to make my algorithm look good. And hey, I get 0.001% better than the existing algorithm, so please publish my paper. Um, so reporting how an algorithm performs on average across some chosen set of test instances is just not good enough. It's not trustworthy. Um, so the, um, we have to ask why the test instances were chosen. Uh, were they hand selected to make the algorithm look good? Uh, and we need to encourage people to report weaknesses of algorithms as well. Um, sometimes it's just common benchmarks that are used because you inherit them and it's expected that you use those ones. But do we ever scrutinise those benchmark collections? Do we ever ask where they came from, whether they're still fit for purpose um, and whether they're biased um, and need to be updated? So the test instances should ideally have all these nice properties. Um, and how do we even know whether or not the test instances we have have that? So that's what, one of the things that instance based analysis can, can visually show you. The second motivation in the space analysis is around this reporting on average thing. Um, averages are not nuanced enough for us to really understand the strengths and weaknesses of an algorithm for particular types of instances. We lose a lot of information when we just average across the whole collection. Um, so just because an algorithm is best on average doesn't mean it doesn't have weakness that we should try to find. Uh, there's a whole no free lunch theorem thing. Um, and we really need to try to understand how the characteristics of different types of instances are impacting behaviour of algorithms um, so that we can work out the conditions under which we would reasonably expect one algorithm to shine over another. Um, every algorithm has things that it's exploiting and if the instance has those properties, then it's going to do well. And if it doesn't, it's, it's not going to be competitive. Um, so that's what we're trying to, to achieve. Um, where we can report algorithm performance based on instance properties rather than averaged across all types of instances. So the standard approach for testing algorithms that, that we see a lot in the field, um, I would say is in the darkness of these black boxes. Not only is often the algorithm a black box, um, but we have some test examples that are often um, also um, hidden, that their properties are hidden from us. Uh, and we have a trust metric, um, some kind of measure, you know, gap to optimal solution or you know, some measure of how well the algorithm performed. Um, but we report that on average. Um, and so the black box is everywhere. We need to crack them open. So John Hooker has been complaining for decades that the way we test heuristics um, is wrong. We need a more empirical science of algorithms. So that's what I've been trying to focus on with instance space analysis. So the first problem to tackle is how do we scrutinise those test examples to make sure that they're sufficient, they're enough, and I can trust the results. And the second problem we're tackling is um, this average. Um, how can we get more nuanced understanding of how an algorithm is performing rather than just on average across a chosen test suite? So Matilda tackles problem number one by basically cracking open this uh, test suite and helping you see all of the instances in a 2D plane. Um, where we can actually understand the boundary within which all test instances lie, mathematically defined boundary, and we can see where we actually are testing and where we're not testing, where we don't even have any data. Um, so I'll so show you that soon. And Matilda on the algorithm side is also um, showing the strengths and weaknesses of different algorithms across that space. Um, so we can understand the generalization of, of where good performance can be expected. 
So it's not just um, me that's saying this. Is the, the, the way we test algorithms has been criticised for a very long time. Um, and it's really no one's fault that <laughs> to this day, we still have papers being submitted to journals that still have the old, you know, I tested on these 10 problems on average, and this is what how, how good my algorithm is. Um, we know there's a problem, but we haven't had the methodologies and tools to, to help people do it any other way. Uh, so that was the motivation for instance space analysis and for making the tools available through our online um, resource called Matilda, which I'll talk about soon. So the goals of instance space analysis then have been to understand and visualize the strengths and weaknesses of algorithms, trying to figure out which algorithm should be used when, but not just performance prediction, um, the why is important. Why? What insights can we get into why an algorithm performs well in that part of the space for instances that have those characteristics? We want to try to facilitate a more objective approach to assessing algorithms across the whole instance space um, instead of just chosen test instances. We want to do that to improve research practice, to try to establish trust in algorithms and avoid disasters when you choose the wrong algorithm for the wrong moment. Um, it's also really important that we can scrutinize benchmarks. We all rely so much on these common set of benchmark problems. Um, and we need to know how good they are, whether they have those properties I talked about. And the instance space can also reveal to us where we would benefit from additional instances, where we're missing uh, valuable information about how algorithms perform. And um, we have methods for how you can fill the instance space with new synthetic instances, just so we can get that more comprehensive view. Uh, so we can expand existing benchmarks, make sure they're fit for purpose and, and drive further insights um, and recognise where new algorithms are needed. So Matilda, matilda.unimelb.edu.au is our website where you can go and create your own instance space analysis. There's some library problems that I'll talk about soon. Um, let's go through a case study, though, so you can see what it's all about. So um, a familiar case study for all of us in combinatorial optimization is university timetabling. Um, I'm going to show you what happens when we apply instance space analysis. We have two algorithms, algorithm A and B, and you're a university, you're trying to decide which one to buy um, to solve your annual or semester, every semester timetabling problem. Um, based on 8,199 test examples of different university timetabling problems, uh, considering um, which algorithm is better based on who has the smaller number of student clashes on average, uh, you would probably decide that, oh, look, algorithm A and B are pretty competitive for the 8,199 instances. Um, they're tied, um, you know, 3,600 times, but, you know, it's, it's similar in terms of who's got a, a, an edge over the other. But if you had to choose one, you go with algorithm B because on average it's slightly better, right? So which algorithm do you trust more? I don't know, let's say algorithm B has a slight advantage. Um, but really... This university that's trying to make this decision needs to know more than this, needs to know more than on average which one is better, but which one is better for my type of timetabling, you know, with the characteristics that my university has in terms of lecture theatre capacity and student demand and, and all sorts of things. So we're going to crack open this 8,199 test example so you can see what they're like, and we're going to look at the strengths and weaknesses of algorithm A and B. So this is machine learning now being used not to find an answer to the problem, but to learn about this problem and how algorithms perform on it. So more detail now. Um, I, the two algorithms, algorithm A and B, are from international timetabling competition, um, two top performing algorithms that basically are taboo search and a simulated annealing. And uh, the instances, we have the 8,199 instances are from three different classes. We have the real world competition instances from the University of Udine in Italy. We have... Um, basically 4,500 randomly generated instances from Edmund Burke's team. And we have um, over 3,500 instances that are real world like from a piece of work that, that I did um, on how to generate um, real world like instances that are also discriminating of algorithm performance. Um, so not easy for both, hard for both, but actually help you find um, some differences. So that's the detail then of a, a bit more of an academic breakdown of the 8,199 test examples and um, the two algorithms, simulated annealing to boost search. And um, the question is, which algorithm is better? Um, so you can break it down by class and you can say, okay, well, if I had a random instance, I'd probably go with to boost search. And if I had a real world like instance, an Italian instance, I'd probably go with simulated annealing. 
Um, oh, sorry, it wouldn't need it here. Um, so again, taboo search has a slight edge. But let's see if we can um, identify strengths and weaknesses. And here's a spoiler, um, both of these algorithms have weaknesses, um, as we will see. So what can we learn about this combinatorial optimization problem? So we're trying to visualize the space of all possible test instances, not just those 8,199, but all timetabling problems. Um, what is the space that they occupy and where do we have this data? Uh, we have to, to do that, we have to identify the features of the instances that affect difficulty, that affect how the, perform, how the algorithms perform. Uh, we need to mathematically define that boundary within that feature space, and then we want to project to 2D so we can see it. We can then scrutinise the benchmarks that we have and identify any gaps in the space um, and, and see their similarities and differences. Um, and we can figure out how we can generate new instances to, to be more comprehensive. Uh, and we're going to gain insights into the strengths and weaknesses. So I, I call the area of the instance space where an algorithm has evidence that it performs well, um, the footprint. And the area of that footprint is a, an objective measure of how good and powerful that algorithm is. Uh, and we use machine learning to, to generalize that. Um, based on evidence. Um, but we can also, so that's a quantitative measure of algorithm strengths and weaknesses. We can also qualitatively, though, explore this space and, and get that why, understand why an algorithm is performing well, for what kinds of instance, what are the properties of the instances that are, are affecting things. Of course, we can use all this to do automated algorithm selection um, and construct algorithm portfolios based on those features as well. Uh, and we have the opportunity to try to um, develop new algorithms based on those insights with the goal of trying to have footprints that cover the whole space. So there's always an algorithm that's going to be good for every instance. The framework that um, we've built this instance space analysis on is just based on some very old um, work of the algorithm selection problem from 1976. That's the dotted um, interior here where we have problem instances. We calculate features of those instances. We have algorithms. We have performance metrics of those algorithms, and we're trying to learn the relationships. But beyond algorithm selection, my goal has not been just to, to pick the winner not interested in just predicting which algorithm will perform best based on the instance features. I'm interested in generating this instance space, being able to visualize it, study the footprints, the, the areas where algorithms perform well, um, and trying to infer algorithm performance across the whole space, um, as well as identify where new benchmarks are needed and, uh, and to assess the, the quality of the existing benchmarks. Hey, um, just, a, just a question. Uh, Andrea, so are you, you're trying to do some inverse uh, operation, right? Yeah. So instead yes. of asserting which one is the algorithm that is winning, you want to, to know which one is the instances in which the algorithm is winning in a certain sense. I, I want to learn all those relationships so I can answer questions like that, yes. Um, for, for what kind of instances will this algorithm be successful? Yeah, that's what, we, that's what we're aiming to see. Yes. So, so this metadata in the centre here, to, to do all this, I need, for every problem, I need metadata. I need a set of instances that have measurable features. I need some algorithms with a performance metric. And we call that the metadata, if IFYA, if you, and I always say, if you don't like it, you can change it. You can always find new instances. You can always think of new features. You can always throw new algorithms into the mix. And you can always reconsider what you're choosing to measure to learn as much as you can about the relationships that are here. Machine learning about this problem. So the metadata requirements then for your problem, we'll, we'll talk about timetabling, but for your problem, you can be thinking about uh, what are the features that actually make this problem hard for different algorithms? Um, and for the instances I've got, which instances are going to show a diversity in those features? I don't want a whole bunch of instances that are pretty much of equal difficulty. I won't learn anything. Um, where are the real world problems? Do I have instances like that? Uh, do I have discriminating instances? For algorithms, um, I want to make sure the algorithms have very different underlying mechanisms. Uh, there are many algorithms that pretty much do the same thing under a different name. We, that's not going to be helpful. We need to have algorithms that have fundamentally different ways that they search the space so we can learn something about the, the success of those strategies. Uh, and think carefully about the performance metric, what's relevant, how am I going to define what good performance is? Because you have to define good performance to ask the machine learning to tell you where to expect good performance. That's your choice, how you define it. So for this case study, for timetabling, my instance, I have 8,199 instances coming from three different sources. I have 32 features that I've chosen to measure about this timetabling problem. Many of them are based on the underlying graph coloring problem. Um, we have a teacher conflict graph, 
um, students. So it's graph colouring. You can't have the same colour uh, for any two events that have to be scheduled. They can't be scheduled at the same time because it's the same teacher lecturing both or the, the same student enrolled in both subjects. Um, and then there's some, uh, so there's some properties of the graph and then there's some properties of the timetabling problem, such as the number of events that can only be scheduled in one room or the, the, the slack, the ratio of the number of available seats to the seats you need. Uh, so a whole lot of features. You can get very creative choosing these features and then um, instance space analysis will tell you which ones are relevant. Uh, the performance metric for the two, we have two algorithms simulated nearly to boost search and the performance metric is just, um, we're trying to minimise the total student clashes. Of course, we could have chosen something else. Um, and we define good performance of an algorithm to be, of these two algorithms, you are good if you have the smallest number of student clashes. So good is best here. So I'm going to show you some results that show where each algorithm is good, meaning best. You can also change that. You could say you're good if you're within 2% of the best or something like that. There's great flexibility in choosing how you define good performance. So very quickly, because I'm going to run out of time, instance space analysis methodology involves several steps. Um, it's all fully automated in Matilda. Uh, so before you start, you have to collect your metadata. And then we have five steps. We create the instance space, um, which involves some feature selection and dimensionality reduction. We can then visualize the benchmarks and look at the diversity within that boundary. We can visualize the algorithm footprints and understand strengths and weaknesses and uniqueness of each algorithm. We can explain those strengths and weaknesses by inspecting the distribution of features across the space and try to figure out what, which instances have which properties in certain regions. Of course, we can automate algorithm selection as well, just do machine learning predictions to say, if your instance is like this, you should use this algorithm. Afterwards, we have a whole lot of insights that hopefully come from that analysis where we can devise new features to try to improve the separation of good and bad performance. We can generate new instances to fill the gap. We can devise new algorithms to try to improve the coverage. And this is an iterative process. And we repeat until we have convergence of the instance space, meaning there's no more gaps to fill. There's no more insights to come. Everything's perfectly explained. It's, it's a dream. Um, but let me just show you um, how this works with timetabling in the last five minutes. So, create the instance space, which features should be selected. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions we have to ask. I'm not going to have time to go into the details, but the projection um, for the timetabling example, we had 32 initial features. The feature selection chose five um, as most useful to separate good and bad performance of these two algorithms. These are the five, the slackness, um, some properties of the underlying graph, the teacher connectivity graph, the number of one room events, the standard deviation of the, the class size. It shows these five features. We have our own projection out. We don't use principal component analysis or any other dimension reduction techniques. We develop our own, uh, which is serving our purpose. Because what my purpose is, is I want beautiful pictures that have very nice linear trends to help interpretability. And I want to know the easy end and the hard end. And so we developed our own, it solves an optimization problem to work out the optimal projection algorithm, uh, the optimal projection uh, linear transformation to project an instance from initially 32 dimensional um, feature vector. We've then selected five dimensional feature vector and then we project to 2D. So the Z1, Z2 gives you your coordinate in the instance space. The details of that algorithm are in this machine learning paper in 2018. Uh, so I won't go into that. But let me just show you then the instance space. So this is what an instance space looks like. Um, where do the different instance classes lie? So for the 8,199, each one of these points is a timetabling instance. There are 8,199 points here. The blue points are the Italian university competition instances. There are 21 of them. The yellow ones are, oh, sorry, the pink ones are randomly generated from Edmund Burke's team. And the yellow ones are the ones that we generated to be real world like, in other words, closer to the Italian university ones, but also more discriminating of the performance of these two algorithms. The ones down the bottom here, are, that's where all the ties are. Both algorithms perform equally well there. We can't learn a lot, but the yellow ones, we learn a lot more because they were deliberately constructed to be discriminating. So the red boundary is this mathematically defined boundary. It, it, it's, it comes from taking the upper and lower bounds of all the features and just projecting those vertices into the 2D plane. So this is the boundary within which timetabling problems are defined. 
And you can see that this 8,199 instances, it sounds like a big number, but it doesn't fill the space. Um, there's more we could do if we wanted to really understand how algorithms perform across this whole space. Uh, so do they fill the theoretical boundary? No, not in this case. Are they diverse? Uh, you can see the Italian ones are all kind of clustered together, and that makes sense. One university's timetabling properties don't change much from year to year. Um, is there bias here? Um, do, do these instances span uh, all the real world context? I don't know. We really only have the Italian university in this instance space. I'll show you another one in a minute. Um, where are other real world universities lying in this space? Are they different from random? Uh, so now we can look at algorithms across this space. So, so we, that was just a view of the instances and where they came from. Now let's look for those instances, how algorithms perform. So on the left, we have simulated annealing. On the right, we have taboo search. Blue means good, orange means bad. So you can immediately see that taboo search on the right, which was on average better, has a lot of weakness at the top, lots of bad performance at the top where simulated annealing was better. Um, Unfortunately, blue is printed on top of orange. There, there's some weakness in the middle here. But we can use, to my eyes, this is a little um, confusing. We can use machine learning to clean this up. Machine learning can predict good and bad here. So this is a support vector machine that has learned to say simulated annealing will be good at the top and bottom. Taboo search will be good at the bottom and in the middle. All right, so they're both good at the bottom. Those are the, the ties, easy instances. They both get the same result. We can then look at the footprint. So I don't know if you can see in the background between the dots, we've kind of got this blue um, shaded region. We've calculated the area of the, using convex hull areas, we've calculated the area of what we call the footprint and you can compare. And simulated, sorry, Taboo Search has a slightly bigger total area than simulated annealing does, um, but their footprints are in different regions. So um, the support vector machine, the precision is, is reasonably good when Taboo Search says that, sorry, when the, when the support vector machine says that Taboo Search will be good, it is correct 89.6% of the time. And when it says simulated annealing will be good, it is correct 86.3% of the time. So it's not perfect, um, but based on the features we gave it, that's what it was able to learn. Um, we can look at who's which algorithm has a footprint that overlaps real world instances? Well, the Italian university ones were out here where actually neither of them are predicted to be good. Um, so that's a problem with these two algorithms. Um, we're not prepared to say which one is going to be better. Sorry, I shouldn't say they're not good. We don't have a clear view about which one is going to be better. Um, and we can ask whether or not there's some uniqueness. So you can see that simulated annealing is uniquely good at the top. Um, so step four, we can try to explain the strengths and weaknesses. Um, I need to wrap this up quickly. Um, but to do that, we just look at each feature that we had and we look at the distribution. So blue means minimal value, yellow means maximal value. So I can see in the top where simulated annealing has a unique advantage. That corresponds to the instances with a high slack value. Yellow is the maximum. Um, in the area where they're both tied a lot down the bottom here, that corresponds to a high... Um, event degree teacher connectivity feature, uh, one of the graph properties. Uh, so you can stare at that and you can try to get some insights to explain various things. Um, or of course, we can do automated algorithm selection. We have two support vector machines, each predicting for each algorithm where you can expect it to be good, smash them together, and we get this algorithm selection thing. So we recommend simulate annealing at the top, taboo search at the bottom, because the support vector machine had slightly better precision, so we trust it more. And in the middle here, the gray area, um, neither support vector machine is prepared to say this algorithm is going to be better. Um, so that's interesting. Um, that often tells us where we need more evidence. Um, if you listen to this selector, um, you are choosing the best algorithm 83.9% of the time, which is better than if you just chose your favourite algorithm. Um, you would only be right 74% or 70% of the time. Okay, so there's a whole lot of insights that can come once you've done the instance space analysis, but I'm running out of time. You can get insights into the instances and realize um, whether they're good enough. Um, you can get insights into your algorithms and, and under what conditions each algorithm is going to perform better. Um, you know, taboo search performs better for mid-range slack values and where there's more one room events, those kinds of insights. You can um, keep going. This is an iterative process. So you can think of more features. You can think of more instance classes you want to throw in, more algorithms. Um, and, uh, you know, you can partner with people around the world who are, who are studying these problems. So, so this is the next iteration of timetabling. Um, 
the blue ones, the pale blue ones are the instances that I just showed you, 8,199. The pink ones are the real world Italian university. The purple ones are additional real world university instances that my co-authors um, sourced from other universities around the world. And the gray ones in the background are instances that we have generated to try to fill this space more comprehensively, this new space. So we've redone the instance space analysis with different metadata now, augmented, and um, have a much more comprehensive view. You can see how the, the blue ones that we had in the last space have now, um, they're only a small part of, of what the whole instance space could be. And we've looked at different algorithms, exact and, and heuristic, um, and that's some work that, that has just been published this year with people from the Technical University of Vienna and University of Udine. Um, so it can keep going. So that's Matilda. Um, and the motivation was just to provide an online tool for you all to be able to do your own instance space analysis and for us to collect these case studies in our library. Um, we have problems in optimization, machine learning, forecasting, even software testing. Um, there's features, there's instances you can download, there's feature code you can download. Um, these are some of the problems we have already um where you can get started um, working with our new instances and uh, you can add your algorithms in there and you can generate the pictures to show how your algorithms footprint compares to the other algorithms that are there the ones in the pale gray are coming uh, i've got students working on all these kind of topics um, the ones in white are already up there um, so if you want to use matilda to do your own machine learning for combinatorial optimization there's two ways you can download the matlab code from github um, or you can use uh, the online version on Matilda by creating a user account. Uh, we have some tutorials up there and how to do that. And uh, I've run out of time, so I better stop. Um, oh, let me just say that these are all the groups around the world that have started using Matilda. We'd love to see a red dot wherever you are. Um, it's open source for academic purposes. If you want to do instance space analysis with industry partners, which I have been doing with Boeing and Australian Government Defence and, and other organisations, um, it's not open source for that. Um, we enter into contract arrangements um, to do proof of concept studies for commercial purposes. Um, so yeah, if you like the idea, you can use it for your own research. If you want to use it with, with industry partners, um, then reach out to us and we can see how that's possible. And uh, happy to take any questions if there's time, but I think there is not time. <laughs>